McMullen at 97.3 ESPN.com. And, of course, covers the league nationally. Uh, Fan Rag Sports, NFL. Happy Thanksgiving, John. How are you, pal? Doing well. Uh, happy early Thanksgiving to you guys. That's right. And uh, we know football tomorrow. We'll get to the Eagles and the Packers stuff as well. But uh, tomorrow, you know, I saw an article basically suggesting the NFL needs to make Thanksgiving like the NBA does Christmas, like highlighting their best teams in their best games. They pretty much got maybe the best case scenario they could. You got two teams playing for first place in the middle in the early game. Uh, a huge matchup in the NFC East in in the late in the middle game and in the late game, uh, bo- you know, big time playoff meeting in that game. Yeah, it has worked out well. It traditionally doesn't uh, because the Detroit Lions are, are so rarely <laughs> relevant, but they are this season. But I, you know, I don't agree with that Christmas Day mentality because there is something to the tradition of it, and obviously the Lions and the Cowboys have been playing that game. For a very, very long time, so uh, I think you got to keep them in it uh, moving forward. And the NFL certainly will. And then the prime time game—that's where you you sort of can match up what you think is going to be two good teams. But yeah, we all know in the NFL what what looks like it might be a really good matchup uh, when the schedule comes out doesn't necessarily turn out to be true when the game actually arrives. That's a good point. Yeah, you don't know a heck of a lot. I thought, I think a lot of people thought Indy and Pittsburgh would probably be, uh, while they're playing for playoff positioning here, maybe people thought they would be playing. Well, I guess the Colts are playing for the division, as are the Steelers. So really, uh, you know, they got two teams. That's the problem with the NFL, though, John, is everybody's mediocre. Everyone's just stuck in the middle. Yeah, well, not everyone. The Cowboys aren't. Uh, but, yeah, I, I understandably, Seattle, New England, few teams, but very few uh, are really solid top-tier teams that you know are more likely to win. And, and hey, that's how the NFL likes it. Uh, Derek Carr kind of said it after the game in Mexico City. It's like it's an 8-8 eight and eight league, and there's three or four players uh, that make the difference on certain teams. And that's what the NFL wants, because the NFL wants every fan base to have hope. And generally, everyone does, with the exception of Cleveland. Uh, <laughs> just San about Francisco, now, now, don't win. forget them. Yeah, it's San Francisco, Chicago. Uh, John, uh, we just did our 5-5 five, five, Ugly Five. There's only five teams that belong in the Ugly Five. Literally, everyone else is either good or mediocre. You've got... San Fran, Cleveland, Jacksonville, Chicago, and the Jets. Everybody else has four wins or more. And then you have Seattle, New England, Dallas, Kansas City, Oakland, and Denver. That little mix with New York. Everyone else is just mediocre. You got those five teams. And really, (laughs) Seattle, New England, and Dallas are good. And you don't know about the three teams in the West yet. But the league is, you know, it's just a bunch of mediocrity. Yeah, well, you can, they'll call it parity. You can call it mediocrity. It's really just semantics. But uh, and, and you're right about those teams. And, and take out Cleveland, and you're probably right, San Francisco, uh, which is a couple of years away talent-wise. But say you put uh, Jim Harbaugh in Chicago next year. They, they might turn it around in one year. Yes. That, that's how quickly it can happen in the NFL, and that's what the NFL wants. Uh, and that's the mentality of this league uh, is they want everyone competitive and we talk about it all the time when you look at a college football schedule if you're a powerhouse team you kind of can look at your schedule and pick out five or six games that are glorified practices glorified scrimmages uh, that you know you're going to come out with a W that's just not what the NFL is. You got to fight claw every week, and, and generally, the amount of one possession games in the fourth quarter is astonishing. And when you're talking about one possession games in the fourth quarter, well, one play can turn it uh, each way. And as we saw with with Houston and Oakland, maybe even a referee's call can turn it a, 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 a difficult way for certain teams. So. It, there's a really small margin of error. That's just the way this this league is built. And, and then, by the way, that's the way they want it. 
John McMullen, 97.3 ESPN.com. Of course, covers the neat league nationally as well, fanragsports.com. A uh, couple more NFL things before we jump onto the Eagles here. Um, you know, you get this time of the year. We talked about this yesterday, John, where Thanksgiving is kind of the jumping off point, right? This is like where you start to figure out, all right, who's in play and who's not. Are you a person, like, in the NBA, you know, I, I would say it's not even beneficial to you to be a playoff team if you're the 7 or 8 seed in some instances. Now, if you're a young team and you've arrived, getting those playoff games in the NBA would probably be helpful. But if you're just a team that's a veteran team and you're in the middle ground, probably not. But in the NFL, are you an advocate of getting in no matter what? Like, if you're the Eagles and you can get in, you want to be a playoff team, right? Right? I mean, you oh, are. sure. Exactly, right? There, no. There is no ifs, ands, or buts that – because there are no, that group no of people part. out there. There's that group of people that say, well, if they get in the playoffs, maybe they think they're better than they are. And in this league, that's almost not even an argument because everybody's the same. Yeah, I mean, you want to get in, and you've seen it maybe a generation ago uh, to be a, a lower seed. You weren't going to go anywhere. Uh, but you've seen it in recent history. The two Giants Super Bowl championship teams, uh, they got hot at the right time. Baltimore uh, got hot at the right time. Uh, was a 10-win team. Green Bay, that might have been the worst Green Bay team <laughs> uh, when they had their run, when they were really, really good with Aaron Rodgers. Uh, you know, they won 14 games one year. They didn't win the Super Bowl that year, but they won it when they snuck in. And they got hot at the right time. So, uh, yeah, I mean, if you can get in there, you don't know what's going to happen. And uh, that's the whole mentality of, look, certainly you would like to have one of the top two seeds. And it's still a huge advantage to have uh, a week off. Uh, and that's tremendously helpful. But as I just mentioned, we've seen too many teams in recent years uh, go from a lower seed to winning the whole thing. So, uh, especially with a team like the Eagles, because you're so young uh, at at the quarterback position. I mean, you just want to get in the playoffs to get Carson Wentz that kind of experience. Right. Think about Seattle uh, in their first year with Russell Wilson, 2012. They had that yeah. great game where RG3 got hurt in Washington. And, and sort of everything – just took off from there after he got that experience, that playoff experience in his first season. Yeah, I mean, there's nothing but good things that happen if you make the NFL playoff. Yeah, I agree with that, John. I had a guy last night trying to convince me otherwise. I'm like, dude, there's no way this team thinks they're good just because they make the playoffs. Like, that's preposterous. They know they've got deficiencies. And it's just because every team in the league is on the same level. I mean, Right or wrong, a 10-6 and six team and a 7-9 and nine team are almost identical. It's just a, a bounce here, a penalty there, oh, a bad yeah. call there. I mean, the, the, the difference between 10-6 and six and 7-9 and nine in this league, not that big. Uh, Thanksgiving means football. It also means the firing squad. You start to hear for the first time names, John. I want to throw you a couple of guys. Give me your intuition on whether or not they will make it uh, to Black Friday, the NFL version of Black Friday uh, safe. How about uh, Chip Kelly? Uh, Chip Kelly's an interesting one because I, I think the, the, the 49ers are going to move on from Trent Balke, the general manager. If they do that, uh, to me, the only way Chip Kelly stays is if uh, Tom Gamble uh, can get ahead and get that general manager job. He's obviously good friends with Chip Kelly. That, when the Eagles fired him, that kind of set off the whole uh, issue where Howie Roseman and, and Chip had the feud. So uh, if he gains power, uh, uh, Chip stays. If he doesn't and you bring in somebody from outside the organization, no, nobody's going to want to take on Chip Kelly and what he does because there's not enough people in the NFL that believe in what he does. All right, uh, Jeff Fisher. I know he's an interesting one. Uh, four and six, doesn't want to be seven and nine. He's on that path. Jeff Fisher, does he make it? 
He shouldn't. I'll, I'll say that, but we said, you know, if you're talking about nuclear war, you're talking about Keith Richards, cockroaches, and Jeff Fisher as probably the only <laughs> entities are gonna that are gonna make it. So you never say never. They were talking about extending him, but they haven't signed the deal. And look, it's just a bad situation for Jared Goff. If you're the Los Angeles Rams, you have to maximize the potential of Goff. You took him. There's no getting out of it now. And you can't maximize his potential with Jeff Fisher as the head coach. He's a defensive guy. Uh, you need to bring in an offensive head coach who knows something about the quarterback position. So they should move on from Jeff Fisher. And at the end of the day, I believe the the dragging of the feet leads me to believe that the Rams have finally come to that conclusion. So I, I think he's going to be out at the end of the season. Wow. All right. I got three more Toughies, okay? Um, let's go with Marvin Lewis. Yeah, I think Marvin's out. I really do. I, I mean, every game he coaches sets a new record for the most uh, games coached with one team without winning a uh, playoff game. So he sends that record every time uh, the Cincinnati Bengals take the field. And they've had a lot of injuries this year. Uh, it's been a bad season. They've lost a lot of people through free agency. He's lost a lot of good offensive coaches. People around this league have tremendous respect for him. But we saw it here in Philadelphia with Andy Reid. No one is saying Andy Reid wasn't a good coach, at least people in the NFL when he was here in Philadelphia. But sometimes the shelf life just expires, and that's what's happened in Cincinnati. The shelf life has expired, and, and they have to move on. All right. Um, how about – there's a couple other ones. I mean, uh, you know, real quick, uh, Todd Bowles, New York. All right, I think Todd's going to stay. Uh, it, it's the get to one of those teams, they, obviously they need to solve their issues with the quarterback position, and if they do that – they're one of those bad teams that can turn into a good team really, really quickly uh, because they have so much talent, particularly on the front seven on defense and at, at the wide receiver position. Uh, and and to say he, he had a very good first year and, and to say what uh, the GM there did by, by sort of not signing Ryan Fitzpatrick, he took away his offseason. And the strength of Ryan Fitzpatrick is, is sort of that work ethic, is sort of working harder than everybody else. And, and the takeaway is off season. You basically guaranteed he was going to be a failure. Uh, so I, I think Todd Bowles is going to be back and given one more chance. All right. Uh, is there a guy that I didn't mention that you think is going to be gone? Well, I think the biggest name could be Mike McCarthy. Uh, because Whoa. there is a, you know, there's uh, the Green Bay fan base is tremendously spoiled, at, at, at least the, the newer generation, uh, when you're talking about having Hall of Fame quarterback play for over 20 consecutive years uh, with Brett Favre and then seamlessly into Aaron Rodgers. And we talk about it all the time. And, and we in the media fall for it, too. And we always say, well, you know, the Packers will get it going at some point. Just because we've seen it so many times in the past, uh, I, I think he's done a really, really poor job uh, as a play caller. Uh, and he sort of hedged back and forth. He gave it to Tom Clements at one point, took it back. And, and Don Capers, he may be able to save his job by firing Don Capers. Because they're giving up 40 points a game in their losing streak. And and he's one of those antiquated guys from a different generation that sort of hasn't caught up to all these spread concepts brought into the league over the past five to seven years. Uh, so he might be able to spin it that way, fire Capers and keep his job, but both of them are on the hot seat. 
John McMullen with us talking NFL football. Of course, John, you're our Eagles insider as well. And today, Doug spoke to the media. The Eagles actually went through a little bit of a practice on this Thanksgiving Eve. But the story of the day, Nelson Aguilar, and uh, the news comes out that he's seeing a sports psychologist. The Eagles actually revealed that, which surprised me a little bit. What can you tell us about Nelson Aguilar's situation today? Yeah, I think Doug made a HIPAA violation on a live mic. <laughs> I think he's probably uh, uh, not happy he did that. But, that you know, that's the beautiful thing about Doug Peterson. You ask him a question, and sometimes he'll tell you the truth. And he did today. Uh, and we all knew it. Uh, I mean, you have a, a sports psychologist on staff for a reason. And if anybody needed to see him uh, in recent weeks, it was Nelson Aguilar. He practically, I mean, he said it after the Seattle game. He was mentally shot, said he had to get out of his own head. Uh, but you shouldn't say that, and I think Doug made a mistake by doing it. Nonetheless, uh, I think, as I wrote today on 973ESPN.com, all, all eyes are on, you know, what are the Eagles going to do? Are they going to play him? Are they not going to play him? They're certainly, at the bare minimum, I think, going to scale back his workload. I'm talking about a guy who's played 85% of the snaps to this point. Uh, 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 and that's just, they don't get enough production from that position. Uh, so you have to give, even if you don't trust Doriel Green Beckham, and they probably don't, they certainly don't trust Bryce Treg. Uh, the other PT who's taken your nickname, PT, Paul <laughs> Turner, the most <laughs> famous man in, in Philadelphia now. Uh, Doug admitted he's just a slot guy today. So if you play Paul Turner, that means Jordan Matthews has to go to the outside. We know he can't do that, at least do that well. So they're in a tough position. On the other hand, if you're ever going to gain confidence as a wide receiver, it's going to be against this Packers secondary. It's awful. Uh, They have so many injuries. We talked about it. They're giving up 40 points a game. Mike McCarthy on his conference call with us today admitted, hey, We've been awful in the secondary, stopping passing uh, attacks. You saw Kirk Cousins last week. You know, if I tell you guys just off the uh, the, the cuff that Kirk Cousins just threw a 70-yard post pattern for a touchdown, you're automatically going to say, oh, Deshaun Jackson got a touchdown. No, it was Pierre Garçon who couldn't run by you and me. And that's how bad the Packers secondary is. So if Nelson Aguilar is going to get any confidence, maybe this is the week to get him some confidence against probably the worst secondary you're going to see the rest of this season. Uh, Doug was asked every which way to Sunday about Aguilar today and wouldn't commit to whether or not he was playing in the game on Monday night or not. Uh, Is that just because he has the time? When when do you think he'll make that decision? I think he'll make it. They're off for Thanksgiving. They'll be back in practice Friday. I, I think he'll make it by then. Uh, and he'll probably announce it on Saturday. Uh, I think he's going to play just because they don't have any other options. But I do think he's going to scale back his workload, maybe even significantly. Maybe cut that 85% down to 30 or 40%. But I just don't think the Eagles have enough options to completely sit him. Uh, the one caveat to that would be if he's if he goes to the head coach or, or he tells the psychologist that, hey, I can't play, I guess you don't play him. But other than that, I think he's going to be out on the field at least somewhat. Half of the Eagles running backs uh, went out of the game against the Seahawks. Uh, what's the latest on Darren Sproles and Ryan Matthews? Well, Darren's going to play. Uh, neither practice today, and that's not a surprise. And, and Doug flat out said that Darren's the kind of guy who doesn't even need to practice. Uh, and and the rib fracture, it, it's in a safe place, as the Eagles have said. So he'll put on a flak jacket and play. Ryan Matthews less likely to play and and, and Doug said today if he does play it'll be on a very very limited basis so I I would if I were the Eagles I'd say you know what just sit down we'll activate Paul Turner 
He'll have an extra <laughs> receiver to take some of the workload off Aguilar. And he can take a look at Wendell Smallwood as a compliment in the backfield to Darren Sproles. Good stuff, John McMullen, 97.3 ESPN.com. And, of course, uh, Eagles Packers Monday night. John will be back with his pick for the game on Monday. Happy Thanksgiving to you, John. Enjoy the football, pal. Hey, you too, guys. Happy Thanksgiving.